morning and welcome to Brentwood Baptist Church. We're glad you decided to worship with us. Today, Senior Pastor Mike Glenn shares a sermon entitled, Fear of Being Alone, from our new sermon series, Fear Not. But first, here are a few things you need to know. June is an exciting time for Brentwood Baptist. For the first time ever, we are bringing home all of our missionaries serving around the world. They've never been gathered in the same place at the same time. Join us Sunday morning, June 28th, in worship at all our campuses as we celebrate our missionaries. Then, at 6.30 p.m. that same day, join us for a commissioning service where we will honor them, pray for them, and send them out to the nations. The adventure begins tomorrow as we journey off the map with Vacation Bible School. Children age 5 through grade 5 are invited to join us every day this week from 9 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. for VBS. On this expedition of a lifetime, children will need to follow their guides as they discover that Jesus is the ultimate guide on a journey uncharted by us, but known to Him. Whenever faced with the unexpected, children will learn how to listen to God's direction when He says, this is the way, walk in it. We'll see you tomorrow. Summer is here and beach camp for 6th through 12th grade students is just around the corner. We'll head to Panama City Beach, Florida on June 19th through 23rd for five days and four nights of fun, worship, studying God's truth, and much more. Today is the last day to sign up for the regular price, so head to our website and register. Marriage is designed to be a beautiful expression of the way Christ loves His bride, the church. Join us on June 18th at 6 p.m. in Hudson Hall for a celebration of marriage. Ryan and Carrie King will provide entertainment and we will honor those who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this year. The cost is $15 and includes dinner. Visit the website today to register for the event and childcare. Information on these and other items can be found in your bulletin or on our website at BrentwoodBaptist.com. Now, if you're a first time guest, we would love to have a record of your visit. You can provide that by filling out the communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you or in the bulletin if you're worshiping with us in Hudson Hall. You can also use this card to update your contact information or to submit a prayer request so that we can be praying for you. Just drop it in the offering a little later in the service. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge couples within our church who are celebrating their 50th anniversaries this year. Thank you for being an example for all of us of what Christ honoring marriage looks like. Congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Years ago, a British rock band by the name of the Beatles was growing in popularity. Our country's space program was literally taking off. The St. Louis Arch was being completed, and the Vietnam War was escalating. President Lyndon Bain Johnson had been elected to a second term of office. Martin Luther King and other civil rights activists were marching on the city of Selma, Alabama and the Voters' Right Act was passed. Hillary Rodham Clinton and Lou, uh, Lou Alcindor, better known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, were high school seniors. And what you may not know is that the 11 couples sitting in front of me were making wedding plans. Sometime during 1965, they stood before their family and friends and they vowed to love, to honor, to cherish, and richer and poorer and sickness and in health until death did them part. Little did they know perhaps that life would challenge them that would put those vows to the test. Some of them have experienced life-threatening illnesses, numerous relocations, financial disaster, tragic accidents, the loss of a child, 
and other very painful life situations. But with God's help, they have persevered and they have attained 50 years of marriage together. They have honored their vows. And this morning, we have the opportunity to celebrate with them this 50-year milestone and to commend them for their faithfulness, for their devotion, for their love for each other, and more importantly, to praise God for their marriages. So now, would you join me in recognizing our honorees? And if you would hold your applause until the last couple has been recognized. First of all, may I introduce to you Mary Ann and Tom Morrison. Loretta and Charles Land. Carol and Tom Fields. Dolores and Charles Johnson. Louise and John Bean. Dave and Sarah Cagle. Pete and Carol Coots. Patsy and John Wilson. Diane and Jim Jenkins. Marie and Alan Ashburn. And Sharon and Maurice Painter are other honorees. Congratulations, couples. <clears throat> Thank you for demonstrating to us what love is. Love is unfailing. May I pray for you this morning. Oh, gracious God, as we gather and worship today, we do come to you, God, with grateful hearts, grateful that you love us, grateful that in your love for us, you have a mighty plan for our lives. And Father, sometimes that, in, that plan includes a life partner, and Father, we thank you for your great plan for marriage and for life as couples. When we leave behind what we have known as individuals and singleness, where we cleave to each other, Father, and where we weave a new life together. And Father, I'm so grateful for these couples today who have persevered, who have demonstrated to us that love is unfailing. Father, a remarkable example of Jesus Christ on sacrificial uh, devotion and love and care for us, his people, and his church. So, Father, I pray that th the years ahead would be even richer, would be even happier, would be even more joyous than the last 50, and that we can look ahead in great anticipation, Father, in knowing that your love for us will never end. And what a great thing to celebrate. In Christ's powerful and loving name, I pray. Amen. The boat was rocking as the storm came rolling in. The disciples feared the end was near as they stood in the rain and the wind. Then the rain fell harder, lightning struck the water. Everybody trembled on board. No chance to be saved from this watery grave until they heard the voice of the Lord.
we come to a time in our service when we calm our hearts and still our spirits and pray to our Father. This is His world. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but those moments of our lives when we are prayerless, we are actually saying to the Father, the equivalent of, God, I got this. But in moments like this, we do just the opposite. We find our way to a place of prayer. And we say to the Lord, you've got this. And so for these few moments, let's do that together. Our pastor will be here. There will be those gathered around him. And let's find that place, whether it's seated where you are or on these steps, wherever God would posture you, to say to him, you've got this, Lord. Help me trust in you. Let's be seated as we pray together. Lord Jesus, in these moments, we still our hearts before you. We want to acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that this world is yours and that all the inhabitants belong to you. We thank you for the reminders of faithfulness that are all around us. These couples that we've already honored have reminded us today of your faithfulness. And Lord, we look around and we see each other and we know some of the stories and some of the challenges that we all face. And we are reminded that you are faithful, that you've never forsaken us and you've never abandoned us. And we're grateful that today in your house of worship, your people can gather and declare your faithfulness. So as our pastor opens your word, as we listen as we respond with gifts, as we worship together with singing. May we hear above it all your voice. Don't fear. In Jesus' name. Well, I thought I was doing pretty good getting ready to celebrate my 35th anniversary, and uh, I've been severely upstaged this morning. Uh, but I have noticed that, gosh, being married 50 years certainly does good for you guys' hair. Most of you just, I mean, Pete, is, is, is it good hair dye or just, is that, is that what it is? Just only Claire all knows for sure, huh? Just a, man. You don't see this much, and there's a couple of reasons. One, um, people are getting married later. Uh, you know, my dad was 21, 22 when he married my mom. She was 19, and uh, so for their 57 years together, it's, I was uh, 24 when I got married. Now they're waiting to their 30s, and so you have to live a long time to make 50. Uh, that's one of the things. The other thing is, is that we now live in a divorce prone culture. Uh, we do not have a culture that supports marriage now. We have a, uh, a culture that actively encourages divorce. And if you're not happy for whatever reason, then you're encouraged to go find your happiness. And any of us who've been married for, for longer than a week will tell you that, that 
Happy just kind of comes and goes, doesn't it? Just then. <laughs> About half the children in our nation will grow up without the influence of a father in their lives. And if you want to know how devastating that is to our culture, go to a prison. And the prisoners there will tell you either they hate their father or they never knew their father. That's the one constant theme of the population of a prison is they have very, very little relationships with their dad. We're encouraged now, according to our culture, uh, to find your true self. And most of the time that involves a series of relationships. But those of us who have stuck with it understand that you find your best self in the security of someone who loves you, warts and all, uh, and allows you to be stupid sometimes and, and won't laugh at you too long until you recover. Our church is committed to supporting marriage, Christ-centered marriages and Christ-centered families. Uh, we think that is the best way to raise healthy, Christ-centered children. And it is the best way for, uh, for a lot of us, as God has called us to be in marriage, to find our true selves in relationship. Not everybody has that call. Some are called to be single. We know that. Uh, but uh, for those of us who have called, it is the best way for us. It is one of the testimonies that we have in establishing Christ-centered homes in our neighborhoods so that people will know that there's a place of safety and a place where they can find the love of God and the home that is focused on Christ. Now, we're also having Vacation Bible School this week, and we will have several Vacation Bible Schools across the summer with our various campuses. It's one of the most important things that we do because we get to meet a lot of children and a lot of families. And when we get to talk to them about the importance of their child and the importance of their marriage and the importance of their family, and it's one of the ways that we make a first connection with a lot of people. And you're supporting all of that. All of our support of the family, all our support of the children, things like Vacation Bible School, through your faithfulness to this moment. Uh, as the ushers will come forward, if you join us in, as, as in uh, Baskin Chapel in the overflow, uh, we welcome you as well, and the ushers will be coming there as well. So let's continue our worship uh, and our praise of God as we continue to give. Let's pray together. Lord, receive the gifts of your children. Uh, we give them to you in great celebration and enthusiasm, mindful of how good you've been in our own life, asking only this that you use everything we are and everything we have so there's not a man, not a woman, not a child who doesn't know of your goodness. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Today I want to introduce to you Cody Castle. Cody moved to Nashville about two years ago after college. He grew up in Mississippi. And when he was a child, he accepted Christ as his Savior. But during his teen years and his college years, he sort of fall, fell away from the Lord, got disenfranchised with the church. But when he moved back to Nashville two years ago, he began a new journey. And he started going to church again. About a year ago, he came to Brentwood Baptist. And he was moved by the worship services and the preaching of Pastor Mike. And then he fell in love with someone along the way, and she had a strong faith. And so they began to talk about what it meant to follow Jesus. And so Cody actually read a book called The Case for Christ about defending his faith and how he could do that. And he was convicted that it was time uh, to renew his faith and to be baptized. And he said, I want to be the kind of man that can defend my faith and I will be righteous before God. And I want to serve him. So today, Cody comes to make this public. And this is a surprise, a Mother's Day surprise for his family and his mom and his fiance who are here today. But today he wants to be baptized in obedience to Christ. So Cody, I ask you, is Jesus your Lord and Savior of your life and you want to follow him for the rest of your days? Yes, he is. Then it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you as a brother in Christ in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks. 
I used to think I was tall uh, until I did the chapel service for the Atlanta Hawks, the NBA team in Atlanta. I, I, I don't even rate short with those guys. I mean, the shortest guy on their team is taller than I am. Uh, even in our staff, I don't know if you've noticed that, but our staff is tall. Link and Aaron and, and Jay, Phil, these guys are tall. I'm not used to being the shortest guy in the meeting, but sometimes I am. It's, it's, it's funny, isn't it, how much of our lives and how much of the things that we talk about, we do so in comparison to something else. Is something good? Well, compared to what? Is something bad? Well, that depends on what we're comparing it to. Uh, and this is kind of what happens with Peter in the story that we read today. If I were to ask you, do you believe in Jesus? You, you would all say, well, yeah, sure, I, I believe in Jesus. But if I were to say to you, compared to what? Then it would be a little different answer, wouldn't it? Because it's not that we don't believe in Jesus. It's just that given the moment, we may believe in something else a little more. Like Peter. It's not that he lost his faith in Jesus. It's just in that moment, he believed the storm a little more. Matthew chapter 14 is the story. You're familiar with it. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this famous story of Peter walking on the water. The story follows the feeding of the 5,000, so you can imagine the kind of day it had been for the disciples. Now immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he was dismissing the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already over a mile from the land, battered by the waves, because the wind was against them. And around three in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them, take courage, have courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him. Command me to walk to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, truly, you are the Son of God. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we find ourselves in one of three places. Either we're in the storm, just out of the storm, or about to get in it. So we pray that our courage will always be based in you, our faith always focused on you, and that no matter what else is going on, our confidence will always be in you. We pray this in your name. Amen. What an incredible day it had been. Uh, this story immediately follows the story of the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus had taken a little boy's lunch and provided a meal for over 5,000 men and most of their families. It was one of those significant moments where we began to see that God is doing something new. The way that Matthew lays out his gospel is that he shows us that that, God, that Jesus is now the new Moses and he's leading his people out of uh, the slavery of sin into the promised land of relationship with God the Father through Jesus. And now we have the story of the manna that we have in the Old Testament. We now have Jesus feeding the 5,000 in the place where there is nothing. Now there is plenty. In the place where we didn't have enough, now we have too much. 
And with that, Jesus tells the disciples, get in the boat, go on the other side. Nobody asks him how you're going to get there, where we're going to meet you. They're just so tired, so excited, they absentmindedly get in the boat, don't think anything about it. Jesus goes off by himself to pray. Have you ever noticed how many significant times in Jesus' life are preceded by a substantial time in prayer? The night before he picks the disciples, he spends all night long in prayer. Before the crucifixion, he spends hours in the Garden of Gethsemane. Every time we have a significant moment in the life of Jesus, most of the time it is preceded by a significant time in prayer. Hold on to that thought, we're going to come back to it. But understand, it was Jesus' habit to prepare in prayer. Okay? Underline that in your little brains. It was Jesus' habit to prepare in prayer. The disciples had made their living, most of them had made their living on this lake. They had grown up there. It was what their fathers had done. But when they were old enough to stand, they started fishing. They knew how to handle the boat. They knew what to do with the nets. They knew how to read the water. They knew how to read the sky. It was what kept them alive. Now, either they were so tired that they didn't pay attention to the signs, or they were so distracted by everything else that had been going on, or maybe they were just careless. But they got into the boat and started to go across the lake. They had done this crossing hundreds of times. They could literally do it in their sleep. But this time, this time was different. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by very steep cliffs. And when the wind is funneled through the cracks and the crevices and the valleys of these cliffs, it, it can become a very sharp focus wind, and the Sea of Galilee can literally become dangerous in a matter of minutes. Now, uh, if you grew up in the South as I did, you spent your summers water skiing on a, a, a TVA lake, uh, you know what it is to look out over across the hills and see the, cl the clouds getting dark. You know it's going to rain, but you want to get in one more lap before you go. And you push your luck. And it's one of the bounciest rides that you have. You don't want to look scared because that's not cool. But it crosses your mind more than once that if this or that fails, if this or that changes, you and everybody in the boat could be in trouble. The disciples were in trouble. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. They had been trying to get across this lake for hours. They couldn't. For every wave they got past, the wind would push two more on them. They weren't making any progress. Their boat was too heavy. The boat's not that big. Uh, the, the boat's maybe 10, 12 feet tall. It's, it's made for uh, 10 to 12 feet long. It's, it's made for four, five, maybe. This, this boat was overloaded. All of the disciples were on there. The boat was too heavy. It was breaking too deep. The water was coming in the boat too fast. They were bailing. They were yelling. They were panicked. And those who had made their living there, the fishermen there, knew it was over. We're not going to get out of this. They began to yell, blame each other. Somebody should have paid attention. They were in full-blown panic. And then somebody sees somebody walking on the water. Now. There are all kinds of stories about the Lake of Galilee, about fishermen whose boats had capsized, who had drowned in the storm, who lived on the bottom of the sea. And if your boat got in trouble, if you weren't paying attention, they would jump up and snatch you and pull you down. Now, you all laugh because you don't believe in ghosts. They didn't either until they got in the storm. Then you believe in ghosts, don't you? Oh, yeah, let the night be especially dark. Now, let your imagination get a little activated and then let a door slam. This house is haunted. The same house you've lived in all your life, now it's haunted. Oh, yeah, 
I know nobody believes in ghosts, but you weren't on that boat. I've told you before, all my life, I believe there was an alligator under my bed. <laughs> to this day, I will not let my hand slide off the bed. <laughs> now, you think I'm kidding. I don't know. My hand does not know. Now, you're going, that's stupid. There's no alligator under your bed. The only thing I'm saying is I still have both my hands. And one of them yelled out, it's a ghost. And every one of them believed it. Now, now I know you're going that silly, it doesn't make any sense, but you've probably never been that scared. You let your imagination, see, Alfred Hitchcock knew this. He knew your imagination was worse than anything he could put on the, film, uh, on the screen. Uh, in the famous movie Psycho, where it was the famous shower scene where the, where, where, where the lady is supposedly murdered in the shower, and the only thing you saw was the knife coming through the curtain. That's the only thing you saw. People wouldn't shower for weeks. Really, after that movie, they were so scared because of what he allowed their imagination to do. All you do to do is kick off your imagination, and all of a sudden it is much worse than it could ever be. Now we have a ghost. There's somebody who's been living on the bottom of the sea, and he's going to come up and snatch one of us. Maybe he'll snatch you. Finally, in the panic, they hear Jesus' voice. Don't be afraid, guys. It's me. Well, what's Jesus doing out here in the middle of a lake? How did he, Peter, redneck that he is? Now, now there, we always kind of, when we read the story of Peter, we always kind of get, get the feeling that he's from the deep south, Galilee, you know. But this proves it, right? What's the famous words of a, uh, uh, what's the famous last words of a redneck, right? Hey, fellas, watch this. Okay. Here's Peter. Lord, if it's you, get this, command me, right? Don't let me, don't allow me, don't may, mother may I, nothing. Command me, make it imperative for me to walk out on the water to you. Don't give me a choice about it. And Peter hears the one thing he did not want to hear. Come. Really? Now, Peter was a fisherman. He'd been in a boat before. He had stepped over the side of a boat before. We call that swimming. <laughs> right? I mean, this was not the first time he had thrown his leg over the side of the boat. He had done it a, a lot of times. So now can you imagine him stepping over the side of that boat, testing the water? He'd done it before and his, his foot had sunk. Now it didn't. And, and the other foot, and now he's standing, sat, hang, hang, hanging on the boat. Stepping on the water, looking at the other disciples, laughing. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> and listen, I know we slam him a lot, but for whatever, you know, three steps, five steps, ten steps, he did it. Okay, I don't know of any of us who are practicing in the bathtub at home. <laughs> he did it. Let's at least give him that. And then the Holman, the Holman translations and a lot of translations smooth it over. The Greek says he saw the wind. When he saw the wind, he began to panic. And you're thinking, you can't see the wind. You get that scared, you can. <laughs> Jesus told Nicodemus, you, don't, you can't see the wind. The wind blows, but you can't see it. Oh, yeah, you get that scared, everything becomes alive. And he slowly began to sink. Now, you would think the story would say he disappeared from sight. Bloop, that'd be it. It does it. He eased down. He begins to cry out, Jesus, don't let me drown. Please save me. And what is Jesus? You would think this, the next part of the story would be, and Jesus ran over to him. Jesus doesn't. He reaches over. He was standing right in front of Jesus when he began to sink. He was with arm's reach. I'm thinking, had I been there, the next word would have been, and Mike panicked and jumped toward Jesus. And Jesus had to carry Mike back to the boat. That would have been me. I would have latched on like a, a scared kid. You know, when they get you in that death thing around your neck and wrap their legs around you and they won't let go. That would have been me. 
But Peter sank right in front of Jesus. Why did you doubt? Well, the waves were real high. The wind was blowing real hard. It's not that I didn't believe in you. It's just I believed in the storm more. Have you been there? Your little boat gets tossed in the storm. Your little boat gets caught in a bad wind. And it's not that you don't believe in Jesus. You just believe the storm more and you panic. And fear never leads you to make a good decision, does it? And in the panic, we make decisions where we think we have to take care of it ourselves, where we have to do something in our own strength, where we have to figure it out in our own wisdom, in our own reason, and we slowly begin to sink. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is, well, practice. We don't practice the present. So when we get in the middle of the storm, the first thing we want to do is, where's Jesus? Because we're not used to discerning his presence. We're not used to hearing his voice because it's not part of our daily routine. Most of us get up in the morning, look at our calendar and say, I got this. I can handle this kind of day. This day doesn't have any pressure. And so you don't spend as much time in prayer. You don't spend as much time in the study of the Word. And the storm comes unexpectedly. You never expect the phone call to come on Tuesday, do you? And all of a sudden, your day changes. All of a sudden, what you thought was routine isn't routine. The winds pick up. Your little boat starts taking on water. And the first thing you want to know is, where's Jesus? I can't find him when I need him. It's because you're out of practice. You do those things in practice so they become so habitual, so habit, that you will do them without thinking. Remember, Jesus prepared in prayer. You and I have that same opportunity to spend the time we need to in prayer to be ready for when those moments come. You're in one of three places in your life. You're either in the storm, just out of the storm, or about to go into one. That's where the three places where all of us live. And the moments when it is quiet, the moments when it is it is easy or routine. Those are the moments that we have to prepare. Those are the moments that we have to practice. To practice the presence. To practice our listening. To practice our obedience. So that when the storm comes, we're ready. The second thing is, is casual sin. Now, I, I know you, you, you're going through your life real quick going, I, Mike, I don't have any major sins. I, you know, and we always compare ourselves to the latest axe murderer in the newspaper. Uh, I, I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, talk, I'm talking about those little things of disobedience. Uh, those little times where you know what the Lord asks of you. You know what obedience looks like, but you compromise it just a little bit. You, you, you cave in, in in the practice of holiness just a little bit. And you do it just a little bit now and just a little bit tomorrow. And you just a little bit enough till you finally go all the way. And it's just little bit by little bit by little bit. And here's what we know about sin. Sin makes you numb. Okay? It's what we know about addiction. Uh, addiction, when you start the addiction, whatever your addiction is, you reach a certain high. And then as your body tolerates that addiction, you have to become more and more addicted, use your drug of choice more and more, so that you can attain that same level of high. Because the, the addiction makes you numb. So Christ is there right in front of you. But you can't discern him. You can't find him because you're numb. Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what happened. When the full weight of the world fell on Jesus, he knew what it was like as a human being not to be able to discern the nearness of the Father. And the whole time, 
Jesus is within the arm's reach of Peter. And Peter almost drowns. Within arm's reach of Jesus, and Peter almost drowns. It's not that he doubted. It's not that he lost his faith in Jesus. It's that he believed the storm more. For some reason, we just don't think Jesus understands what it is to live in our world. We don't think that Jesus understands the complicated situations that we find ourselves in or the questionable situations that we have to find an answer to when it seems there is no right answer. Does Jesus understand what it is to be an economist in this world? Can you figure out what it is to be an accountant, an attorney, a CEO, CFO, a manager, a teacher, a professor, a homemaker? Does Jesus understand that the, the, the message you get into when the law isn't quite clear, when the right way isn't black or white, but is always lost in that fuzzy thing of gray. And so you think you have to figure it out all by yourself. You think that being a Christian is, is great, but that Jesus really can't help you where you are. So you begin to try to live your life in your own power and your own reason, and then the storm comes. And it's not that you doubt Jesus, it's just that you believe the storm more. You believe your own gifts more. You believe your own wisdom more. You believe a friendship more, a relationship more. You believe the corporation more in that moment than you do Jesus now, I know you're looking at me going, well, Mike, I would never do that. That doesn't even make any sense. I know because you're sitting in the sa safety of this sanctuary. But in the storm, we panic, and fear never leads you to make a good decision, does it? So what do you believe more than Jesus? What is it in this moment of your life, in this storm, that you believe more than Jesus? I, I, I know it, it, you don't doubt Jesus. You still believe Jesus. It's just that right now you believe something else more. Why is it that we love Romans 8? What's the promise? Nothing will separate you from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. What was Jesus' last promise to the disciples in the book of Matthew? That's right there at the end where we, where we always read the Great Commission. You know, if you grew up Southern Baptist, kind of the mission statement of Southern Baptist, and we always get hung up on going to the world and make, make disciples. What's the last part of that promise? I will be with you. Don't worry when you're arrested and drugged before councils because when you are, the spirit I give to you will be with you and tell you what to say. The thing that we're really afraid of isn't it isn't the storm, it's that we'll have to do it all by ourselves. And the promise is that nothing will separate you. Not the storm, not the problems, not the wind, not the rain, not even death itself. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus comes to us even in the middle of the storm. So what is it that you believe more than Jesus? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to give you a time to think about this. I'll let you meditate on this. What is it that you're holding on to now? More than Jesus. What is it you're more afraid of? The storm? Your own gifts. Your own talent. Your own wisdom. Your own reason. Reason. 
trusting in something else than Jesus is why you are so afraid. And the one thing that Jesus said, the one thing that was said by God in all the scripture more than any other commandment is this. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He is with us. of trouble come, oppression storm beats at your door, no need to Thank you.
So if I were able to pull you aside one by one, would you be honest enough to tell me you're afraid? I think most of us would. That's not God's will for you. Not at all. And it begins with the relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, by admitting in our lives that what we have lost, we cannot find again. We cannot replace it. What we've broken, we cannot fix. And by confessing him as our savior, by receiving the gift of his life on the cross, and by professing him as our Lord, he opens up a life for us that is just beyond our imagination. Now, I know I've said a whole lot. It's just a handful of words. Run outside the door. Our ministers are waiting on you. It's a big sign called Next Steps. Go to them. Fine. Say, I want to know more about this relationship. Perhaps it's to be a part of Brentwood Baptist Church. We'd love to welcome you into our family. Wherever it is, however Christ has come to you, he's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Remember, it's said more times than anything else in Scripture. It's probably the one thing that God wants you to hear today. Don't be afraid. God bless you. We'll see you next week.